Uh, I am Kyle Tutt, co-founder and CEO of Pinata. And Pinata is the easiest way to use IPFS. Um, we've been around since uh, 2000, middle of 2018, late 2018. Um, and we actually got our start uh, with a, a pinning service because uh, my co-founder Matt and I were building blockchain applications mostly in the Ethereum space um, in 2017, 2018. And um, you know, we quickly realized that a lot of data storage uh, needed to take place on IPFS. And we were running our own nodes at the time. And so we ended up just deciding, uh, you know, probably other people have similar problems as us. So we'll just start spinning up IPFS nodes and seeing if people would be willing to, to pin on top of them. So, uh, you know, at, at its core, we're just a simple pinning service. Um, you can come to us and put your pins on top of us and, um, you know, obviously pay us uh, to make that happen. Um, we really focus on being easy. Uh, so if you go to our service, uh, we're pretty lightweight and simple. Uh, our API is easy. Our um, user interface is extremely easy, um, not too complicated. Uh, we don't add too much to it. Uh, we make sure that we are uh, try to be as fast as possible and then reliable as well and just trying to be up and getting across the network as quickly as possible with these pins um, is basically our, our main uh, goals and main strategy as running as a pinning service. Um, so the, the types of people that use us, uh, so since we've been around um, for a little while, at least for a, a pinning service, obviously not as long as Infura, but um, we've had a, a bunch of different kinds of applications come and build on top of us. Uh, because we did come from the Ethereum space and the Ethereum community, uh, we do have a lot of blockchain applications, specifically Ethereum. Uh, if I were to give a number, I'd say 90% um, of the blockchain applications building on top of us uh, come from the Ethereum space. And that includes things like dApps, uh, DAOs, DEXs, um, pretty much any kind of blockchain application you can think of has used us or is using us. And then as a subset of that, um, there's also NFTs or non-fungible tokens, which uh, is actually kind of going to be the focus of my talk. Uh, and I'll explain those later. And then uh, just traditional apps, so static websites um, and kind of web two type uh, applications also build on top of us and are trying to use uh, IPFS within their, their application to make it faster, better, whatever the case may be. So uh, jumping into it, um, the interesting thing that we've found um, running our, our pinning service has been that we're getting a lot of NFTs or non-fungible token applications starting to use us. And so for those that aren't familiar with non-fungible tokens, um, they really became uh, quite popular, quite, I guess, famous uh, when CryptoKitties was launched, which was a game, uh, a collectible game where you could uh, mint or breed uh, CryptoKitties. And each kitty is actually unique. So the, the interesting thing about um, NFTs is that each NFT itself is um, unique and then uh, they're non-divisible. Um, so they're really, really good at representing assets, whether they're digital assets like a crypto kitty or whether they're physical assets that are represented by um, some other data set. They're really good at, at representing what the asset is and, and who actually owns it. Um, and they can really be broken down into two sections. So you have the blockchain uh, that the NFT is minted on um, and blockchains are naturally very good at um, kind of storing immutable data forever, but just small pieces of it. Um, because if you try to, um, you know, put a lot of data on blockchains, it gets, it gets really, really expensive really, really quickly. And so this is where um, there's the off-chain storage portion of uh, NFTs. And so the main problem 
that NFTs are running into right now is the fact that the majority of the people that are creating these NFTs um, are using traditional Web2 infrastructure. So uh, a lot of these people, whether they're digital artists or game creators or whatever the situation may be, um, believe that because they have a, uh, a NFT that is sitting on a blockchain that they're securing the asset more than they traditionally would. However, there's, um, you know, there's a problem with that. And that is the fact that they're using URLs um, to reference uh, the data underneath. So as you can see on my screen here, um, let's say we have a, a PNG image. That's the digital asset that was created by an artist. And it's this grayscale pinata image right here. Um, that creates a link and a URL, and they usually embed that into the NFT. The problem is, is that obviously you can um, change the underlying asset of that link. And so you can imagine as a digital artist, whether you're um, creating art or music or a game or whatever the situation is, um, and you sell, that piece of artwork to somebody, um, they can't actually prove that the asset is what it's supposed to be. And so if, if you were to buy a piece of artwork and maybe it's been sold three or four times before, before you, um, and they swapped out the underlying image, you'd be pretty upset about that. Um, and you know, it's fraudulent and um, there's just a bunch of issues that come with uh, being able to swap out uh, the underlying asset itself. So luckily we have IPFS to come to the rescue with content addressable data where we're addressing uh, the data based on the data itself um, and is obviously commonly referred to as content IDs or CIDs um, or hashes, however you want to put it. And with that, it kind of changes the paradigm and it introduces security um, and verifiability to uh, the off-chain asset of the NFT itself. So you can see here, um, we have the CID of this grayscale pinata, and that is grayscale pinata, and you embed that in the NFT. And then if that um, asset were to ever change, obviously the CID would change itself. So uh, as a buyer or seller, doesn't really matter, of an NFT, you can prove uh, that the asset is what it's supposed to be. Um, again, just to reiterate over and over again, um, with the URL system, you can change the underlying asset and the URL stays the same with the CIDs. Uh, that's not true. If the asset changes, the CID changes. Um, and that's kind of the uh, paradigm shift that a lot of people in the NFT space um, are still learning. Um, but as soon as they grasp that concept, it becomes very, very powerful for them. Now, uh, jumping into the next problem that uh, we've been running into and I think is, is very interesting for a lot of people that um, are running pinning services or, or any kind of service using IPFS is the question of who pays for the off-chain data. So um, typically what happens is applications come to us and they will say, um, or a digital artist, whatever the situation is, and they will say, hey, um, I want to mint NFTs um, and I want the off-chain data associated with it to be on IPFS uh, through Pinata and I want it to persist forever. Um, and I, I don't wanna pay for it is usually uh, where we end up going in that conversation. Um, and that's a very difficult conversation that we've ran into for um, over a year now is kind of trying to like make our way through um, what is really being asked by the, the user there, what they want as an app developer versus um, what their customers might want uh, that are buying the tokens. And so um, I've been framing this as um, simple concept of is Da Vinci responsible for the Mona Lisa? And so what I mean by that is is Da Vinci responsible for maintaining the Mona Lisa uh, is the real question. And the answer to that is, of course not. Uh, da Vinci is no longer with us. Uh, the painting is something like over 500 years old. Um, and the, the person that, or the body that takes care of that painting today is the Louvre Museum, right? 
Um, and uh, that makes a lot of sense in the way physical assets are transferred. It would be kind of uh, weird if you think about it that Da Vinci would have to think about pre-funding uh, the Mona Lisa for over 500 years to exist um, and not transfer uh, those costs to somebody else, whoever the next person is uh, that's going to actually own the asset. And so um, what we're kind of proposing that the NFT space does to make um, both the NFT buying and selling easier as well as um, IPFS uh, more integrated and more popular within the space um, is proposing a way to transfer uh, the responsibility of who actually has to make sure that the data is, is pinned on the IPFS network. And so the way this could work is that you have a digital artist again, they create that digital um, art piece and they put it up for sale on a platform such as OpenSea, which is kind of like a, an eBay for NFTs um, out there, and, and there's many others, but uh, they're probably the biggest. And so you as the art seller, uh, put it up there and say, hey, um, I'm selling my, uh, my digital art piece. Uh, as soon as uh, I transfer the token from my wallet to your wallet, uh, you are now responsible for that pin and making sure that it actually stays on IPFS. Uh, you know, the buyer immediately becomes responsible for the data. Now, this is kind of an extreme view uh, and isn't very uh, buyer friendly. It's certainly seller friendly. Uh, but you can imagine you might say, hey, you have seven days um, to figure out whether or not uh, you're actually going to pin the, the off-chain asset that's on IPFS. Um, and you could simply, you know, uh, use Pinata or any other pinning service uh, to actually pin that asset. The other way to think about it is something we just called warranties. And if anybody has, uh, once we're through this point, if anybody has better ideas of what to name this kind of concept of as is versus warranties, uh, totally open to it. But um, with warranties, the seller actually defines how long they will maintain the, um, the data on IPFS. And so with the digital artist, they might say, hey, you know what? I'm gonna create this digital art piece. Um, and when I sell you the token, uh, I will also pay for three years of um, the art piece living on IPFS. Um, and then after that three years is up, whoever's owning the token at that time needs to be the one that actually figures out uh, whether or not they should be um, uh, storing or pinning that piece of content. Um, this is a very simple way to think about it, but um, you could also have an instance in that where, uh, you know, the, the creator sells the piece of art. Um, they say it's three years. Uh, that new buyer only holds it for a year, and then they pass it on to the next person. And conveniently, because, you know, that CID um, isn't changing, or if it does change, you know it, you can trust the data itself and, and ensure that the data hasn't changed. So it's a, it's a pretty powerful way to transfer um, the responsibility of who actually needs to pin the data. Uh, another example would actually be uh, with something like gaming. Um, so there's a lot of games out there that are using NFTs uh, to represent game assets, whether it's a, a you know, a, a shield or uh, any a piece of clothing, any kind of gaming asset you can think of is represented also with an NFT on a blockchain. Um, the game company might say, hey, uh, you know, I'm going to support the pinning of this data uh, for as long as I support the game. So maybe they support the game with updates and things like that for seven years. Um, after the seven years, you as the owner of that asset now need to take responsibility and pin it on Pinata or on uh, you know, your server or whatever the situation is to make sure that the asset exists. And if, if you don't, then it ends up disappearing. Um, and this really starts to make a lot of sense once the assets um, that are represented by these NFTs are, are really big and become really, really expensive. Right now, they're pretty relatively cheap um, to post, but once the data sets get large um, that are being transferred by tokens, it becomes uh, you know, pretty important. And so 
What we think um, would help out in the NFT space was, is just define who is responsible. Is it the creator? Is it the digital artist um, that should be responsible for the cost of hosting or pinning that content forever? Um, is it the platform? So there's platforms out there um, like OpenSea or Super Rare, um, Mintbase, I think, or Mintable, something like that, where they, um, they partner with creators and uh, mint this content. Should they be responsible for the content forever? Or should the buyer be responsible for it? And, um, you know, it's not uh, one or the other. Uh, it's definitely a, a spectrum of when it can transfer over between creator, platform, buyer. It could be all three, right? Um, obviously, with IPFS, the creator could pin it, the platform could pin it, and the buyer can pin it. And it's, um, you know, super redundant. Uh, it's really up to, uh, up to them. And one other way to think about it is if you think about how, you know, we buy things on uh, physical assets on eBay, uh, let's say, you know, you have to, you buy a car on eBay. Um, there's a negotiation that happens between the buyer and the seller of, Hey, I bought this car. I'm in Nebraska and you're in California. I need to go all the way to California to pick it up as is. Um, so that's a common, um, you know, negotiation between buyers and sellers. A similar thing needs to take place um, on who is actually responsible for making sure that that content is pinned on IPFS. So how do you transfer this responsibility? Well, with Pinata, it's pretty simple. We have a pin by hash function. Um, you can just go to that NFT, um, find the, the CID or the hash, um, take it and then pin it. And then you can ensure that it's obviously pinned um, for as long as you um, own, the, own the token. And you should be uh, incentivized to actually want to care about whatever that asset is. Um, and to wrap it up, so why is this important? Um, well, it reduces friction. Um, so there's, a, there's this kind of gray cloud uh, that uh, we felt that Pinata hanging around who's actually responsible um, for the cost of storing stuff forever. Um, and if you can easily transfer that cost, then it reduces the friction. Um, it reduces the costs for the creators. Um, you know, they, they aren't always responsible for it. Um, they don't have to think about, you know, how are they going to ensure this um, being around forever? They can, they can pass, to the, pass that to the next person um, and, and make sure that they get, get it as long as they kind of predetermine um, what actually needs to happen. Um, so it reduces friction on the, the blockchain side, the token side, um, but then it also reduces friction on the IPFS side and allows uh, IPFS to have another kind of market that it can go after um, to, uh, you know, obviously increase the usage of IPFS and IPFS is, is really well positioned for this, obviously, because of uh, the content addressable data and your ability to verify and secure the data itself with the CIDs. So uh, that's, that's always all I got. Uh, happy pinning and would love to take any, any questions. This is awesome, Kyle. You've clearly inspired a ton of people in the chat. You're blowing everyone's minds about like awesome integrations around dynamically detecting and persisting NFTs in your account, either through the, um, the marketplace where you're storing these NFTs or your wallet or um, other ways of dynamically doing that. Have you, have you talked with any of the folks in, in kind of that space about these sorts of default integrations for- so We've been spending most of our time talking to the creators themselves um, because they're the ones most interested in this problem. Um, the exchanges and the platforms uh, are right now just kind of subsidizing the problem, so, uh, which is a good, good business model for them. Um, however, not everybody goes through the platforms. And as I mentioned, as soon as the data sets start getting bigger and bigger and bigger that are being exchanged, um, they might not want to subsidize this. Um, but so they haven't ran into the problem the way we have. Uh, it's kind of a, a, a curse, I guess, of Pinata is since we've always been um, charging people, we've always had these conversations. Whereas on other, um, on the, the, the main NFT platforms, they just kind of include it as a, as a service or just include it to make their service run better. Um, so, 
we've talked with all of them. Um, the platforms don't necessarily uh, see the problem yet, but the creators definitely do. So all the people that are out there creating tokens, and these are, these are typically non-technical people, um, or, or, you know, they might have a little bit of technical background, but not a ton. Um, and so this is where that URL versus CID conversation becomes extremely important um, because they understand that point. They understand that their, their hardworking data set, their asset, whatever they're creating, digital artwork, um, can change on them. Uh, and that's not good for business, essentially for them, especially as, if you think about them uh, as content creators. Uh, that kind of undermines what they're actually selling. So that's where IPFS really comes in and, and saves the day for them. That's awesome. Um, question in the chat, um, paid collaborative pins. So things like um, multiple organizations can all help fund and persist things. Is that something you guys have, have pushed on much? Um, so yeah, we have a blog post from like two years ago where we touch on that and how do you share um, actually pinning costs and that's something that certainly we feel is going to happen. We haven't uh, quite figured out how to make it happen yet, but it has been in our minds for over two years of how do you make that happen. Uh, we get the question a lot with DAOs, um, but you can even see it. You could. You could expand that up to enterprise, uh, you know, corporations. Um, they may not actually want to uh, fully pay for something. And if they can split that cost with other organizations, uh, that's pretty powerful. And I was actually at a, a meetup recently where a cloud provider, because of uh, blockchain, had to totally change their, um, their pricing uh, to allow for sharing of infrastructure costs between different organizations. Um, so we're actually already seeing this type of thing happen. And IPFS is just really, really well positioned for it uh, because of the CID. That's awesome. Question from Cody. Um, do you see Filecoin or a Filecoin Ethereum bridge fitting in with this problem? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, as long as you can uh, have a content addressable uh, piece of data, um, that works perfectly fine. And you're still going to have the same exact problem. Even, uh, you know, Filecoin will definitely lower the price, um, but there's still going to be that kind of tension between uh, the buyer and the seller of, of who's actually responsible for the data. Um, so you'll be able to uh, definitely use Filecoin in this situation. Awesome. Another question. Biggest challenge working with IPFS in your infra or serving data? Uh, I would probably let Matt actually take that one. If, if you can find him somewhere in there. Go for it, Matt. I can just bless you with speaking. Oh, I got unmuted. Okay, perfect. Hey guys. Um, yeah, I'd say the, the, biggest, the biggest problem has just kind of been like, uh, playing on the, the bleeding edge of something. So IPFS has been, you know, you guys have been seeing 30X growth every year. You know, we, we've been seeing similar kind of along that same trajectory. Um, the, uh, the biggest challenge is uh, just working with large data sets. Um, I think garbage collection is one I've talked a lot with your team about. Um, serving data has actually been fairly easy I saw that mentioned by Juan. The gateways do a pretty good job of that. So props to your team for that. Um, tooling, uh, make lives easier, better as in for providers. Um, I, I'd say that the, the initial ones would probably be like content tracking. So, you know, how, um, you know, how are, how is your data being served? How many times is a piece of data being served? You know, where's it going? That kind of stuff has been uh, something we've been, thinking about doing ourselves, but just haven't really quite got the bandwidth for yet. Yeah, yeah, Molly, you hit that. Yeah, it's one of those areas where, you know, we we very much felt the need to build build our own analytics tooling for IPFS. We were like, great, we're, we need to make all of these major improvements to the DHT. Um, we need something that helps us validate we're making it better and actually lets us run all these benchmarks. I can imagine the exact same thing is from a pinning service perspective where you want that those analytics like the logging the metrics that you can 
look at your service and optimize and quantify um, the performance you're offering your users. Question from Thomas, do you have much interaction with buyers of assets? If they own the assets, shouldn't they carry the responsibility to ensure its continued existence? Um, so we haven't interacted with the buyers um, that much, specifically just the creators. Um, but we don't really see it as our responsibility to insert ourselves um, into that negotiation. They can figure out whether the seller is responsible or the buyers are responsible or the exchange in between is responsible. Um, we're not too concerned about that conversation. Uh, the only thing we are concerned about is uh, making sure people understand uh, what's actually happening um, and, and setting up the framework to, uh, you know, start that conversation because uh, the friction uh, that we want to reduce is how difficult it is for those those buyers and sellers to actually interact around making sure that the data will exist. Um, so to us, we haven't interacted with the buyers. Uh, you know, we probably uh, will in the future, but um, to us, it's not, uh, you know, a huge um, thing that we want to actually focus on. We just want to make sure that they have the ability to actually have that conversation. Awesome. Yeah. I will say like, I remember going to my, um, my three box wallet. And it was like, whoop, there were the, the ENS domains that I'd purchased. And I was like, Oh, great. Like these appear here by default. You could also imagine every, um, every file or transaction that I've committed. Um, like I want, I, I have a, um, an interest in those being persisted, having right. really easy plugins to, you know, with my local pinning service account, make sure all of that continues existing without a lot of work on my part, make my life a ton easier. Yep. Uh, all right, one more question in the chat, and then we will transition over to Chainsafe. Um, how are folks seeing the main DAP use cases evolve? Things like storing front ends, NFTs, what kind of DAPs are being stored, um, storing end user data? What are, what are people seeing? Open question too. So Kyle, you, get, you and Matt get a first crack, but if other people have a hand, just say it in the chat and I'll unmute you. Yeah, I mean, um... The majority of the use cases um, are just making sure that they have proof of what that data looked like um, or has looked like in the past. Um, so whether it's a small piece of data or a large piece of data, they have that CID record somewhere uh, and can prove it. Um, and this is big in supply chain cases. Um, it's big in whether it's, it's digital assets or physical assets um, and even things like IOT uh, where you're, you're feeding data uh, and you need to make sure that that data can go across multiple, um, multiple different infrastructures or different clouds um, and using IPFS to ensure that that data is not changing um, and ultimately just trusting the data itself uh, and not trusting Pinata or, or any other pinning service. Uh, that's the most powerful thing that IPFS um, is doing and how we see a lot of these dApps actually using IPFS. Uh, 